Hey, Dog Nation, it's Brandon Adams, the host of Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Glad you are here today. We got a lot to do, including a huge announcement coming up about Dog Nation appreciation. It keeps getting bigger. I think it keeps getting better. We'll tell you all about that. Georgia wins in the SEC tournament. We'll preview today's game a little bit with Seth Emerson, who is in St. Louis, and we'll start the show with what could be some good news for uh, Georgia football. We'll do it all next as Dog Nation Daily begins right now. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. So stick with me for a couple minutes here today on Dog Nation Daily because coming up in really just a little bit, I am going to make another huge announcement about Dog Nation Appreciation, our event that comes up on Thursday, March 15th. I keep saying, and I have been promising for a while, that the event was going to keep getting bigger and keep getting better. I think today's example is uh, another reason why when we go down next Thursday night there at the Coca-Cola Roxy Theater at Lakewood, uh, Lakewood, excuse me, the Coca-Cola Roxy Theater at the uh, Battery Atlanta, uh, it is going to be a uh, just a massive, Massive, massive event, an unbelievable night, the biggest thing in the history of Dog Nation, certainly the biggest moment in the history of Dog Nation daily. I'm really excited about it, and the announcement that I'm going to make today is going to make it that much bigger and that much better. We'll do that here coming up in just a moment, but if the reason why you come to a Dog Nation daily, though, is because you want to get your daily dose of UGA football news, and we do have, I believe, uh, some of that uh, here today. Let me, well, I, actually, I, I shouldn't say that it's news, but it, it's at least interesting, and it may foreshadow some eventual news, and it could be uh, eventually good news for Georgia football. Let me kind of set it up this way. If you want to go back to uh, National Signing Day, I mean the February version of uh, National Signing Day, when Kirby Smart met with the media to sort of talk about all the guys that Georgia added to its 2018 class and what ended up being the number one class in the country there were a couple of questions that day that weren't about recruiting they were about guys who used to be on the roster or I should say guys whose status in terms of currently being on the roster may be a a little more uncertain that's probably I guess the better overall all way to say that you know who I'm talking about here I'm talking about Nate Trez Patrick who had been involved in the instant uh the night after the national the night of the the uh, SEC championship game and obviously uh, D'Angelo Gibbs who's not currently enrolled in uh classes for the uh, spring semester uh Gibbs and Patrick both guys who could be crucial for Georgia in 2018 if there is a pathway for them to be back on the uh, football field and be back contributing once again. On National Signing Day back in February, here's what Kirby Smart said about the linebacker Patrick and the defensive back D'Angelo Gibbs. Yeah, I think both those kids are working really hard, um, doing the things we've asked them to do. And to be honest with you, we're trying to help them as much off the field as on the field right now. So that's Kirby Smart saying we want to help these guys as much off the field as on the field right now. I, I totally uh, I love that line from Kirby Smart. I do think that's important. You know, a lot of times we think about college football as being, you know, so we call them student athletes. We think about this sort of parallel track of accomplishing something athletically while you also learn in the classroom. But sometimes the learning process for a, a young man, I can speak to my own life in this regard as well, sometimes that learning process is more than just books, right? It's more than just, you know, reading and, uh, and, and science and math. And, and things of that regard. Sometimes the the lessons that you learn are more about real life stuff. And I, I love the idea that whether it be Nate Trez, Patrick D'Angelo Gibbs, some other players associated with the uh, Georgia roster, there's some work being done by the Georgia coaches to say, hey, we're going to help these guys off the field as much as on the field. Obviously, we know the the sort of cloud that hangs over this conversation is the audience that makes up this show, the person who speaks in this microphone every day. We're all football fans. We want to see Nate Trez, Patrick and D'Angelo Gibbs back playing, but I think we can also be human beings here. Uh, a, a bit too and say while we want you know Gibbs and Patrick back playing football we certainly appreciate the idea that in in whatever regard they've been sort of dealing with uh, some issues in their private life uh, they deserve privacy in that in, in that step as they take those directions towards getting better there and it's kind of nice to see Georgia there to provide them some help and provide them some opportunities and we may be getting a glimpse here of some of that kind of stuff in terms of exactly what is going on behind the scenes for uh, these guys as they try to work their way back to being contributing football players for Georgia in 2018. I thought that uh, Georgia's football Twitter account, the uh, the football program itself, tweeted out a really cool video of the uh, Georgia team, at least some of the players, working with a uh, Athens area boys and girls club. They were uh, doing some stuff there. In fact, if you're watching on video, we'll show you some of this. Obviously, if you're uh, listening to the show, you're not going to see what we're showing. So I'm going to try not to make this too much of a, uh, a, a thing that sort of favors the video audience over the audio audience, be it radio or a podcast. But we'll watch a little bit of this right here, and you'll see the uh, Georgia players kind of you know going into the uh, the, the boys and girls club here, uh, you know, kind of doing some stuff and you know, kind of hanging out and. Uh, 
participating in some basketball. Uh, and, and, you know, look, obviously we know this, the story here, especially in the Athens area, but you know, a lot of these Georgia football players are, 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 are giants, and certainly in their physical stature, but also in the uh, sort of cultural currency that they have in a place like Athens. Can you imagine what it must be like for these young kids to sort of share some time and share a uh, hoop, uh, some you know, dribbling a basketball, shooting some uh, basketball with some of those Georgia players? This is a really cool thing to do, a really nice thing for uh, Georgia to kind of you know, share this time with the Boys and Girls Club in the community. And it's kind of nice to see Georgia kind of out there in the mix of all this and kind of giving back for a, for a community that supported Georgia so uh, full-heartedly to see Georgia giving back in that regard is, I think, a pretty cool thing to do. And I think it's actually really nice and, uh, frankly, kind of touching and inspiring that Georgia would sort of publish this as a video to let us all know, those of us who wouldn't otherwise be aware, of kind of what's going on with Georgia in the community. But there is also a potential football aspect of this video because uh, our staff that works with us, we were all able to notice, and I think we have actually a still frame we can show you if you're watching on video here. You see a couple of guys who uh, Kirby Smart was just talking about a moment ago. If uh, I'm not mistaken here, I believe that I see both D'Angelo Gibbs and Natres Patrick there in the uh, picture, both going through the uh, work here uh, of being a part of this Boys and Girls Club uh, and, and, and being a part of this event, both wearing their Georgia gear, and obviously for a lot of Georgia fans, I think this is going to put some smiles on some faces, and there's going to be the assumption on the part of many that, hey, maybe this means that D'Angelo Gibbs and uh, and Natres Patrick are on their way back to once again being contributing members of the Georgia football team. It's probably appropriate to point out here that the Patrick path and the D'Angelo Gibbs path are, are, are somewhat different. Uh, you know, Kirby Smart did speak about them on National Signing Day together because he was asked about them together, but their path back here is obviously going to travel a little bit different, and there'll be some different circumstances that impact both both the linebacker, Natras Patrick, the defensive back, D'Angelo Gibbs. But as I've said here on Dog Nation Daily a lot, any sight of uh, of Gibbs, who I think his status may have been a little bit more uncertain maybe than Natres Patrick's because you know Patrick's had spokespeople out there on his behalf, speaking on his behalf here in the past. Any sight, any glimpse of D'Angelo Gibbs, not currently going through uh, uh, classes this spring, won't be practicing with Georgia this spring, but is it like a Trent Thompson situation from a year ago? When you do see him, you see some evidence of him, and that leads us to believe that maybe he's working his way back. Well, this is an example of that. A video with uh, D'Angelo being with the team, you see all kinds of message board posts all the time about people who uh, still see him in Athens, which, you know, I can't confirm any of those reports, but those kinds of glimpses of uh, D'Angelo back in the classic city, hanging out with his Georgia teammates once again, being a part of events like this, it sort of leads you to believe that you could sort of get back into the uh, in, into the fold here for Georgia football, and I think that's a good thing for Gibbs personally, but I think it's also potentially a really good thing for uh, Georgia collectively here as well. Now, when it comes to Nate Trice Patrick, it's also worth pointing out that when Roquan Smith, the departure Georgia linebacker was with us on Dog Nation Daily yesterday. In terms of talking about the linebackers, he's expecting big things from this season. He also mentioned Nate Tess Patrick in that group. Here is Roquan from yesterday as a reminder. There's a lot of special guys uh, back there right now. I'm looking for a lot of competition to be going on this upcoming spring because all those guys have some great skill sets from uh, Nate Trez. He's uh, lead, uh, one of the leaders of the linebacker room. Then you have Got like Tate Crowder, Monty Rice, then you know Jaden McBride. So it's, it's a lot of guys there, man. Uh, that has a chance to uh, definitely make some plays this upcoming year. So I'm definitely thinking it'll be a rotation or anything like that because all those guys have a special skill set. Listen, I love the description that Roquan Smith uses there. And obviously, you know, what he says is not going to necessarily uh, – he's not going to be held to that in terms of his prediction. But he says, hey, Natres Patrick, he's going to be one of the leaders for this linebacking core next uh, next season. I'm not telling you that's proof of uh, anything necessarily, but it is music of the years a lot of Georgia fans, especially coupled with the idea that he's back and hanging out with the team and doing things with the team and participating in that kind of stuff. It's kind of nice to think about the idea of Patrick as a leader. We know the situation with the linebacking core apps at Roquan Smith. We talked to Roquan a bit about this uh, yesterday, that replacing him is very difficult to do. And, and maybe it's one of those deals where you can't ask just one guy to do all of it. There is no one next Roquan Smith. We spoke about that on the uh, program yesterday. But there could be a collection of guys. 
Patrick's leadership, the athleticism that some of the other young players bring to the table, where all of a sudden that linebacking core could just be uh, could be just fine. And for Georgia defensive back unit that obviously needs as much talent as it can, defensive backs for uh, Georgia, one of the issues I think we pointed to in 2017 and said that's a position group we'd like to see more from in 2018, maybe beyond. But it takes elite players to make that happen. And some of the elite players Georgia just brought in with the class of 2018, we've obviously talked a lot about them. But some of those elite players that have a chance to improve that secondary were also already on the roster. D'Angelo Gibbs, the status in his future may be somewhat uncertain. The presence of this video may not change that all that much. But here's what's not uncertain. Here's what we can know for sure. That D'Angelo Gibbs still remains a singular talent, an incredible athlete, and a guy that has a very bright future uh, in, in football. I believe for D'Angelo Gibbs, that future is going to end up being in Georgia. I think he's going to be uh, eventually a big time contributor. I think we're going to look at his career at Georgia as being really good. And maybe this video is the moment in which we sort of foreshadow for both Patrick and Gibbs a uh, really good future that happens more immediately than in, in the long term. Both these guys could be back in their own way, contributing for Georgia in 2018. We'll see how it all unfolds. My name is Brandon Adams. This is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. So glad to have you with us. No matter how you may be accessing the program today, if you're watching us, and I always say watching us on video on Facebook Live, let me make sure I take good care of our other uh, video viewers because it's growing every day. It's the Dog Nation YouTube page. So there's actually now more than one way to watch the show live. It's been true for a while. The honest truth is the uh, YouTube folks who watch Dog Nation Daily every day have been saying, B, when are you going to show us some love? When are you going to start mentioning us more, interacting with us during the day? We've been doing a lot more of that on SEC Country Live in the afternoons, and I need to do a lot more of that here on Dog Nation Daily in the uh, mornings as well because the uh, YouTube audience is growing. And if you want a great way to uh, stream the uh, video portion of our show live, check out Dog Nation on YouTube. You can essentially uh, simply search Dog Nation YouTube. You can find that there, uh, and you can watch the show there. Or if you like watching on Facebook Live as well, we're, of course, 10 a.m. every Monday through Friday on the Dog Nation Facebook page, too. We're on the radio at noon on Athens Sports Radio 960 The Ref. Love our friends in the Classic City. It was fun being on the morning show on Athens Sports Radio 960 The Ref yesterday. Had a chance to hang out with the uh, guys there. Always enjoy doing that. And, of course, we are in podcast form, and we try to make the podcast as easy for you to find as possible, whether it be Apple Podcasts or Android devices. Hopefully they feel well taken care of. It seems like they uh, feel like they uh, kind of do. Also, uh, you know, we'll post the show at the worldfamousdognation.com. You can check the show out that way as well. We just like to make a Dog Nation Daily easily accessible for you. And by now you know we are really, really excited about our Dog Nation appreciation coming up Thursday, March 15th. That's a week from today at the Coca-Cola Roxy Theater at the Battery Atlanta. Let me give you a, a couple pieces of news here about this that will eventually lead to a huge announcement about something that I haven't told you before in terms of how Dog Nation appreciation gets even bigger and even better. First of all, let me start with the VIP tickets. You know they have been sold out for a long time. Many of you still want them. That's why I love our friends at Marlowe's who are doing a giveaway right now for a pair of VIP tickets to Dog Nation Appreciation. Of course, the VIP tickets include the, the picture with Sony Michelle and Nick Chubb and Roquan Smith, autograph from all three guys, special VIP access there that evening. VIP tickets completely sold out, but Marlowe's is giving away a pair. Uh, just simply text the word Marlowe's, that's M-A-R-L-O-W-S, to 24242 right now through March 13th. The uh, winner is going to be drawn for the pair of VIP tickets to Dog Nation Appreciation at noon on March 14th. So go ahead and Marlowe's to 24242. You can be, uh, you'll get your link to a register for your opportunity for a pair of VIP tickets to the Dog Nation Appreciation. Let me tell you about one more thing here as well. Our friends at Kroger have a really cool thing uh, going on. It's the Kroger fan question for Dog Nation Appreciation. If you've got a question that you want to ask uh, one of the players who's going to be with, there with us that evening, simply submit your Kroger fan question uh, to the email address. Kroger fan question at gmail.com. If you're uh, watching on video, you can see this. Uh, Kroger fan question at gmail.com. Submit your question for Dog Nation Appreciation there. If your question selected, if we use it that night on the stage for Dog Nation Appreciation, you'll also win a $25 Kroger gift card. So we appreciate Kroger being a part of Dog Nation Appreciation. Looking forward to reading a whole bunch of Kroger fan questions that night and giving away a whole bunch of $25. Uh, Kroger gift cards. By the way, you don't have to be coming to Dog Nation Appreciation to submit your Kroger fan question. That's also a uh, really cool thing there. So appreciate Marlowe's, appreciate Kroger for everything they're doing to make Dog Nation Appreciation as much fun as it can possibly be. And without further ado, let me also say this huge announcement to make right now about how Dog Nation Appreciation gets bigger, gets better, gets more fun. This is going to be awesome because I am very proud to announce to our Dog Nation Appreciation lineup. Also joining us that evening, in addition to Nick Chubb and Sonny Michelle, Roquan Smith, 
Davin Bellamy, who we've already been able to announce. Proud to say that Lorenzo Carter, one of the stars in the NFL Combine this past weekend, one of the great Georgia Bulldogs in recent memory, one of the big reasons why Georgia made a run to the college football playoff in 2017. Lorenzo Carter also going to be with us for Dog Nation Appreciation. Really, really excited about having Lorenzo. He's got some great stories to tell. He'll be telling those on stage there with us that night for Dog Nation Appreciation. But something else that makes Lorenzo Carter's appearance even better, you know, many of you have said, hey, I, I wanted the VIP tickets. I wanted some autographs. Uh, you know, th- th- they sold out. You know, they're they're gone. Uh, of course, the premium tickets are still available. Some of those include uh, an autograph from either Nick Chubb, Sonny Michelle, or Roquan Smith. But people said, hey, we want even more autographs. We want even more opportunities. Well, here's the good news. Lorenzo Carter's appearance that night for Dog Nation Appreciation, he's going to be signing autographs at no additional charge. So you come in the building, with your, even with your general admission ticket in our Sponsors Village before the event begins, Lorenzo Carter is going to be signing autographs there in the Sponsors Village for no additional charge. It's just another reason why uh, Dog Nation Appreciation gets even bigger, even better. A chance to see Lorenzo Carter, maybe get an autograph from him while the opportunity allows, time allows there on that. But at no additional charge, Lorenzo will be signing his autographs there that evening and then being on the stage with the other Georgia players as we reminisce on what was a truly great season for the Georgia Bulldogs. It is great to have you with us here today on Dog Nation Daily. We'll tell you more about that in the days ahead. Lorenzo's also going to be on the show here pretty soon, too. For now, though, let's go to St. Louis, Missouri and check in with Seth Emerson. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. And as I said, Seth Emerson checks in from St. Louis, Missouri. Now, by the time many of you hear this show in podcast form, Georgia will have already played uh, Missouri, I guess, in uh, the second day of the SEC tournament. But we'll still look ahead to that game a bit here, look back on Georgia's win last night against Vanderbilt, and I guess we'll kind of you know stay up in the air on the uh, status of Mark Fox here for a moment as well. Seth, let me start with the basketball, if you don't mind. Uh, a little bit unusual for us here on the program, but I guess the SEC tournament is in the uh, midst here. Georgia looks good against Vanderbilt last night. Was this a team that was playing motivated basketball? Was this a team that was playing against a Vanderbilt uh, team that's just simply not very good away from uh, home very much this season? Kind of where do you sort of, uh, I guess, uh, Describe how it was George was able to be so effective last night against the Commodores. Well, it was both of the things you mentioned. Um, when they played Vanderbilt the first time, it was exactly a month before last night's game. That game was in Nashville, and Vanderbilt was terrible away from home this year. And Vanderbilt was just draining threes left and right against Georgia. Uh, this time they weren't. I think they started like 0 for 6 on three-pointers. By the end of the game, they ended up with more than Georgia, but Georgia so dominated inside that that was irrelevant. I mean, that, that game last night was ridiculous. It was, uh, it was 10 to nothing, and then before you knew it, it was 38 to 13. I tweeted out, that's not a football score, by the way. You know, it sounds like one. Um, and then Vanderbilt briefly gets it to 14 early in the second half, and you're like, oh, and then Georgia got it back out. And yeah, the, the takeaway was, again, this is kind of like where – where was where's this Georgia team been? And they've had nights like that. They had a good non-conference start. Um, they beat Florida twice. They beat Tennessee by 11 points in Georgia. They had a lead on Tennessee late. Um, they in Knoxville. You know they, they've done this. They just they haven't been consistent enough. And if you look at it. I mean, look, they're still in a precarious state, and I don't think last night changed the underlying dynamics of what's happening here. But if they had played like that in just three games, pick out three games against the weakest opponents they lost to, which was Vanderbilt at Vanderbilt and South Carolina both times, you flip those three results, and Georgia's right in the mix for an NCAA bid. And we may not be talking about Mark Fox. We probably still are because they probably needed to make the tournament anyway. Um, but or, or even if they played well enough to you know, win two of those three but close out Texas A&M and Auburn and Tennessee the second time, it, it, it again showed that this team does have talent. They were capable, but they're just nights they're in sync and there's nights they're not. Last night was a night they were in sync. Are you excited about seeing Michael Porter, the uh, Missouri uh, NBA prospect, returning today for the game against Missouri? I mean, I'm assuming that makes Missouri more of a favorite against Georgia, but what does that do for you in terms of, uh, I guess, handicapping the uh, dogs' chances here a little bit? Well, I already saw him. Um, I'm staying at the same hotel as Missouri and a few other teams 
So I, I saw him. I guess I'll see him play this afternoon, too. Um, saw his dad, too, and, and Conzo and everybody. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a weird dynamic. And Vanderbilt did lose a guy, a point guard, who wasn't much of a scorer, just kind of a glue guy. Um, so he's not going to play. But then they sub in Michael Porter, um, who is going to come off the bench, but he could play like 25 minutes. How will he fit in with the team? Uh, you know, is it a positive because you're adding a lottery pick, possibly top five, top three pick? Is it a negative because it takes away from some cohesion? I don't know. Um, Georgia just needs to make sure it does its best to play the way it did last night. Um, when I when you combine Michael Porter coming back and the fact that this is, you know, that Missouri is kind of the de facto home team in this tournament and they did have some fans there last night watching. Um, now, Kentucky is always going to have the most fans. They'll play till Friday, and, and they they were the first fans I saw here. <laughs> and they had like 90% of the crowd last night. But after that, it's Missouri. So you combine those two factors, and, you know, it's going to be a tough out for Georgia. Yeah, I think that's probably fair to say. Let me transition to football here for a moment. Seth, I, I really enjoy, and I think the feedback on this has probably been universally good, the next generation piece that you wrote about Aziz Ojolari and the very interesting sort of lineage he comes from, you know, dating back to his time at uh, Ni- you know, uh, for, not his time, but uh, his uh, ancestors' time in Nigeria. I'm, I'm curious for a piece like that. How much of that do you know going into it? I mean, do you learn that the way the rest of us do? You know, you, you by researching us, by reading it. Did you know some of the Ojolari story before you got kind of got into that? For this really coveted member of Georgia's 2018 class, how much of what you eventually wrote was a mystery to you? Uh, I mean, going the, the backstory on it is that whenever we work on these next generations, we obviously reach out to Jeff Sentel, and he's already written a lot about these guys, and we say, okay, you know, give me um, – Give me some tidbits. Where should I go with this, et cetera, et cetera? The way reporters always talk to reporters, and Jeff's the expert on these guys. And, you know, he did say, obviously, you know, he's got some African heritage, but I haven't really delved in much to that, so delve into that. And I'm, I'm interested in that. And so I, I sat down with Aziz um, at his school and, um, you know, find out he's never actually been to Nigeria. Um, and he doesn't speak Yoruba, which is his parents' language in Nigeria, but, you know, he does appreciate his heritage, yada, yada, yada. I get his parents' numbers, and I call his father first, and it's his father who mentions, oh, yeah, uh, my father-in-law, you know, my wife's late father, was this world-famous artist. You can just Google him. And immediately the light bulb as a reporter goes on. You're like, hmm? Yeah. Okay. And, and I do the Googling while I'm on the phone with the guy. I'm looking at it. And he was worthy of having a New York Times obituary when he passed away in 2011. And right there I'm like, okay. Here we go. I got yeah. my ankle. Um, and I, then I called the mother and talked to her for a while about it. And they're just, they, they were two great people to interview, obviously a great family from everything we hear. Um, just a really kind of nice story to write. What I really liked about it was is that obviously those kinds of angles, the kinds of things that for the most part we don't really pursue here on Dog Nation daily, we, we sort of look at guys like this more you know, as football players. But obviously what you're reporting, and the Next Generation Series is something that Dog Nation done now for a couple of years, but what when you really spend time sort of digging into the family past or the story about how they got here, you know, you do find out that, that not just disease, but a, a lot of these guys, you know, the Nick Chubb story was well told over the course of his four years. Seth, so many of these guys do have, you know, so much more to their lives or how they got to this point is about so much more than football. I, I got to imagine that stuff like that is, is, is personally fun for you, right? Yeah, and, and the thing is, it, it's a cliche, but we all have that story, even though we may not realize it. I could just think, like, if, if anybody wanted to do a story on me that I'm, I'm sure – like three or four people would read, um, you know, there would be two or three things in my background that would be interesting. It would be kind of just latch them out. And in your case, you'd have that too. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know whether it's your family background or, or something, you know, like that. But, you know, I mean, Nick Chubb has Chubbtown. Um, a story that I wish I had done while Sony Michelle was here that I guess CBS Sports ended up doing was, was his parents as Haitian immigrants. Um, you know, and, and, it goes on down the list. I mean, I, I tried a little bit with Lorenzo Carter a few times. The fact that he was a cello player growing up and listened to Yo-Yo Ma. I mean, everyone has these stories. It, not everyone is completely about football. And sometimes they are. I remember I did a Next Generation on Tyler Simmons, and he was 
very much, him and his family, very much about football. Mm-hmm. So I made that the angle and yeah. how they like totally dedicated themselves to getting him a scholarship and, and it worked. Um, yeah, everyone, everyone has a story and it's, it's fun to be able to spend some time and talk to these kids and get that story. I thought one of your questions of the day this week, looking on uh, or Jake Fromm's numbers, or it's been within the last week. I'm not sure what day it actually uh, originally was posted, Dog Nation, but you kind of projected some of his numbers for uh, 2018. I'm probably going to dive too deeply into these compared to probably what you intended, but I noticed that you had more passing attempts for uh, Jake Fromm this upcoming season, but still not the kind of total that would break the imbalance of, you know, George of the last few years, even predating Kirby Smart, has been about like 65%, you know, run to pass. It sounds like even when with the maturing from as a sophomore, you know, the departure of running backs that George has really leaned on, you still don't see this Georgia offense sort of heading more in the direction of that sort of 50-50 split that Mike Bobo kind of had at the end of his uh, end, end of his time here. You still think this is a Georgia offense that's heavily imbalanced in favor of the run against the pass. Is that fair to say based on your projections? Uh, I don't know if I'd say heavily imbalanced. Um, I'm not even sure. Just off the top of my head, I'd have to remember during the heyday of Mike Bobo before he left whether it was like purely 50-50. You always kind of end up at about, um, sorry, live radio housekeeping's at my door at the hotel. <laughs> um, anyway. They always uh, come at the most inopportune time. Yeah, and I'm going to have to put a shirt on um, also. So there's that. Uh, anyway, I guess you can edit that out of the, the podcast. <laughs> but uh, for live radio, there you go, everybody. Seth Emerson uh, has housekeeping, but he's not wearing a shirt. Luckily, I am wearing other clothes. My, oh, my. What were we saying? We're talking uh, about the uh, balance between the run and the pass for Georgia. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's definitely important. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that Fromm's going to pass the ball more. They're going to pass the ball more, period, um, just because of the personnel they have. Uh, and, and Fromm going into his sophomore year but it's georgia they're still gonna they're still gonna run the ball and they've got still deandre swift uh there was a video that georgia produced a uh, trip to the boys and girls club uh best i could tell looks like d'angelo gibbs nate patrick make an appearance in this video is, is that any kind of clue about their status i know that kirby smart was relatively tight-lipped about both guys he was asked about them together on national signing day i've always thought that if you saw some evidence of gibbs and athens much like trent Thompson from a year ago that that'd be a good sign seeing these guys show up in the video is that indeed a good sign if not outright proof yeah, I, I'm, on the Trez, I was a little more clear. I mean, I talked to his lawyer a few weeks ago, maybe more than a month ago, and he said he was enrolled in classes and thinks he should be good to go. Um, so we've known he's been around. But the question there is just how involved is he going to be at spring practice? Um, is there a you know suspension to start the season coming or not? Uh, with Gibbs, you know, he, he's not enrolled in school. Um, we know that, so he's not going to be participating in spring practice but yeah there's been these little signs that he's back around the team and kind of a yeah exactly like the the Trent Thompson scenario from last year can I ask you a question and not to go too deep in the weeds in this but Greg McGarity when Natrez had his issue with the Athens Clark County Police as a probation violation stemming from his uh arrest and winder McGarity did say at the time right that it was not a athletic uh department violation so it would seem difficult to sort of find the grounds for suspension, or or am I wrong about that? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of their way around it. Um, it was always kind of a little bit suspicious, uh, as in where are you kind of getting that? That I mean, my understanding of the policy was always that if you were found to have, you know, smoked marijuana at some point, mm-hmm. that that was a violation, um, period. But... They they say that wasn't, but one of the main reasons Matrez didn't participate in the playoffs and everything was he was in treatment, and that was a court ordered situation. I mean, he was not like physically able to be with the team, um, so that's the way potentially around it is to say that he was just not with the team. Period. It was a medical thing; he couldn't be with the team. Um, he wasn't actually suspended, and that that reason for him not being with the team was not a violation therefore he would be eligible for the start of the season i'm not saying that's what's going to happen yeah but that's kind of the interpretation that gets him to, to be playing against austin b 
Last question for you, and then we'll let you go. I've talked to Chip about this a lot. I'm sure I've talked to you about this a lot, too. You know, this time of year, we talk about sort of hypothetical issues from time to time, like scheduling, who Georgia should be playing more of, who Georgia should be playing less of, and, and things in between. And, Seth, what fascinates me, and I'm, I'm curious if you've noticed this, too, I have never seen the appetite higher from Georgia fans to make potentially radical changes to the schedule. Now, we know that TV ratings down across the board, uh, you know, uh, attendance for the most part down across the board. I, I'm, I'm assuming that Georgia hasn't been impacted by that quite as much necessarily, but, but you know, we know that attendance and ratings are sort of down in college football. It seems like fans want better games. Are you hearing this from the, the same Georgia fans that tweet at you or, or email you or whatever, that, that there is this appetite for Georgia – to, to sort of see a, maybe a maybe a radical difference in scheduling and, and play fewer of these uh, less desirable opponents. You mentioned Austin P as an example of that. Are you noticing a sea change on the part of fans here on this? Well, I, I, I think a little bit of it may be just that we don't have football to talk about right now. Um, I mean, but yeah, people don't want to go see Austin P, Middle Tennessee, and UMass kind of stacked on top of each other. Hey, there's there's no chance Georgia's never going you know Georgia's going to end the Georgia Tech series. It's just that, that's that's a zero percent chance. But filling out the rest of the schedule, you know, when I put it out there to fans in one of the questions of the day, I said I, I outlined the kind of economic and competitive reasons that Georgia does this, and said, would you sacrifice, you know, one day in Athens for having a better non-conference schedule? As in, um, let's say, would you play? Would you rather have games against Austin P and Middle Tennessee, but two Athens dates, or one less Athens date, but that's against a Power 5 team like, I don't know, Illinois, uh, someone like that, someone a little interesting. Um, and the, the feedback I got was they'll take the Illinois game, as an example, uh, that they'll give up the Saturday in Athens. Now, again, I just I don't think competitively and financially there's much motivation for Georgia at this point to do something like that, but I do sense that fans – are kind of tired of just these kind of ridiculous opponents. And, and frankly, when you're talking about Georgia has to pay like a $2 million guarantee to Kent State to come in here, I mean, Austin P is not going to cost much. They're, you know, 500000 the FCS teams are that route. But, you know, there does come a point when these prices are so ridiculous for the, the FBS non-Power 5 teams that you do wonder, like, well, at some point, wouldn't it just make sense to schedule an Illinois or a, you know, a, a Duke or someone like that? Now, the problem with that is then you've got to do a home-and-home, home, but I think there's a lot of fan sentiment that they would rather do that. Well, Seth, we appreciate your time here on Dog Nation Daily. We'll sort of watch this stuff as it, I guess, happens and unfolds over the course of the next few years. And we'll check out the uh, dogs in the SEC tournament today to see if you stay in St. Louis a little longer. Thanks for your uh, time, and we'll talk to you soon. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Yeah, interesting stuff there from uh, Seth Emerson. And when it comes to Georgia scheduling stuff, obviously we've made our thoughts on this, you know, well known that, you know, here on this program, one of the things that we try to do is just sort of uh, reflect what we're hearing from other Georgia fans. We call it the uh, daily podcast for Georgia uh, Bulldogs fans for a reason. This is a uh, fan centric conversation. And the one thing that I just keep hearing from fans is the trip to Notre Dame was something that Georgia fans liked. Um, the you know opportunity to play big time neutral site games to start a season, which Georgia did in 2016, had done before. Uh, what you saw Alabama and Florida State you know do last year, what you'll see Auburn and Washington do this year. That's the kind of game that a lot of Georgia fans are also saying, hey, why isn't that game Georgia this season? That's going to be Georgia again coming up pretty soon against Virginia. But you know, th there's this attitude of. You know, the kinds of things that, that Georgia did in 2017, there ought to be more of that. The kinds of things that, you know, neutral site games that sort of start beginnings of seasons now, uh, there ought to be more of that as well. Now, the point we made the other day that, you know, kind of started some of this conversation for the listeners and viewers of this show is, you know, maybe you eventually traded Georgia Tech for something like that. You know, obviously, that's the kind of thing that if it were to ever happen is – would happen long range very very deep into the future you know scheduling a little bit like turning a battleship it's not something that happens quickly but i'm amazed by the number of georgia fans who have told me if it was a trade between you know keep playing clean old-fashioned hate at the end of every season or take some more big high profile road trips to places like south bend indiana give me more of the high profile game i think a lot of fans are, are really you know pretty interesting 
on all of that. By the way, I'd love to see you at the Georgia International uh, Auto Show or the Atlanta International Auto Show coming up uh, at the end of this month. I'm going to be there uh, Friday, March 23rd from 1 to 3 p.m. If you want more information on the auto show, go to GoAutoShow.com. It's uh, five days there. It's going to be awesome stuff, and I'd love to see you. I'm going to be there Friday, March 23rd, uh, but the entire event goes on for five days around that for the uh, full weekend and before. So check out GoAutoShow.com. You can get yourself some more details on that. By the way, it's a great thing to bring kids to as well. My understanding is the um, there could be like some Star Wars vehicles there. There's some like uh, Marvel Comics uh, uh, action figure, you know, like mascot type folks there. So the uh, Auto Show, a pretty cool thing. Go to GoAutoShow.com. You can find out more about the Atlanta International Auto Show. All right, uh, Butch Jones to Alabama. Is this a thing? Is this going to uh, happen? He was seen. We're, we'll talk about more of this on a SEC Country Live this afternoon on the um, on the SEC Country Facebook page and on the SEC Country YouTube page coming up at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. But Jones is seen at Alabama's Pro Day. He's wearing the Alabama gear. I, I believe this would mean that um, that this is going to happen. We'll play some audio later on. If Nick Saban says he's he he, he wants to hire uh, Butch Jones, he, that uh, that he's interested in, in doing that, that that's something he wants to do. I, I guess the the language there is sort of intended to say maybe Butch Jones gets a bigger and better job somewhere else. Doesn't want to sort of reduce his candidacy for some, some some sort of opening that that might still pop up here at this later date in college football. That's not likely to happen. But you know, a lot of folks are mocking this. I love mocking Butch Jones. I have fun at Nick Saban's expense. But honestly, adding an analyst, this is a situation of do you want him or not? Are you better without him or with him? And another pair of hands from a guy that's been an SEC coach. I actually don't think this is a dumb thing for Alabama to be doing, even though if it's going to be plenty of fodder for uh, plenty of jokes. Uh, we'll see how this plays out. It looks like this is actually about to happen, though. Butch Jones, in a uh, non-coaching analyst role, he'll be – you know, watching game field, breaking that kind of stuff down, but not, you know, coaching at practice or anything like that. It could be interesting to see. Saturday could be a big day for Auburn as uh, Calvin Anderson, the former offensive lineman from Rice, is slated to make his college choice on Saturday. Auburn is one of the teams that he's choosing, or potentially choosing from. I believe that's the only SEC team really seriously in the mix for Calvin Anderson on that. Oklahoma is one of the teams that uh, is being discussed here. I, I guess the favorite, though, according to what some has been said online, is that uh, that uh, Texas may be uh, viewed as the uh, favorite here. Tom Herman, who's done a pretty good job in recruiting, may be the uh, favorite to uh, to land Anderson. But I know for Auburn, who would look at him as potentially a plug-and-play offensive lineman, this would potentially uh, be a big get for Gus Malzahn. We'll pay attention to that. And speaking of grad transfers, I thought that Zach Albalverde fielded an interesting question from some Florida fans at SECCountry.com about Florida's interest in a uh, graduate transfer quarterback. We know that Emory Jones, the incoming freshman, Felipe Franks, uh, last year's starter, and at one point a hotshot freshman himself, or, or thought to battle it out for this job down in Gainesville. But maybe a guy like Joe Burrow, who was a quarterback at Ohio State, who's potentially also looking at transferring, maybe adding him in for some depth, probably would not be a bad idea for Florida. I think Emory Jones may be a bit of a prospect. I think we saw some limitations on the part of Felipe Franks. Gators may have some problems, the quarterback of 2018. By the way, something else we'll talk about on SEC Country Live this afternoon. More video coming out from uh, Mississippi State quarterback Nick Fitzgerald, sort of dealing with his injury situation, looking to be back in 2018. He's thought of as an NFL prospect and potentially one of the real game-changing quarterbacks in the league this fall, assuming he is healthy. Does the presence of more video of him working out and getting ready prove that he's healthy? Well, we'll talk about it this afternoon. SEC Country Live, 3 p.m. Eastern time, on the SEC Country Facebook page and the SEC Country YouTube page. We'll make that your SEC through. As we wrap up here today, let me remind you of our announcement we made early in the program. How exciting is this? The addition of Lorenzo Carter to our Dog Nation appreciation lineup. Lorenzo Carter now with a Davin Bellamy, Roquan Smith, Sonny Michelle, and Nick Chubb. It all goes down on Thursday, March 15th. Uh, cannot wait for this. And the great thing about Lorenzo Carter, uh, he will be signing autographs in our sponsor's village, which is in the lobby there at the uh, Coca-Cola Roxy Theater before the event begins at no additional charge. You can get an autograph from Lorenzo Carter. That's a really cool thing for Lorenzo to do to uh, make his autograph stuff available in, in that regard. It, it's just another example of how much he appreciates Dog Nation. And it's one of the reasons why Dog Nation wants to appreciate him a week from today on Thursday, March 15th. By the way, for more on the SEC tournament for the Georgia Bulldogs, Check out the Dog Nation Daily Double. It'll be posted at the forum at forum.dognation.com and, and as a link to our podcast at dognation.com. Gator Hater Countdown as well. 233 days from right now. Georgia beats Florida again. We'll see you tomorrow on Dog Nation Daily. And for those of you with us on video, both on YouTube and Facebook, we'll try to get as many of your uh, comments in 
as we uh, can. Adam Hart Palmer says, problems for the Gators at quarterback again? Shocking with a little bit of a wink emoji. Yeah, uh, I love the idea of thinking about more problems for Florida quarterback, and I believe we could indeed see some of those. Uh, Jason Bryan Lee, great question. Can we get autographs on personal items? For Davin and Lorenzo, you can get autographs on personal items. Uh, Nick Chubb, Sony Michelle, Roquan Smith, the original three for this event, their autographs are only going to be available, uh, you know, uh, with, with the parameters that were set forth with the tickets when they were first bought. So if you buy a premium ticket, you get an autograph from either Chubb, Michelle, or Roquan. If you have one of the VIP tickets, you get the autograph from all three. But those are not on outside items. Uh, but for uh, Davin Bellamy and Lorenzo Carter, uh, you can bring outside items in for them to sign. Um, for Davin, the autograph comes with the purchase of one of his uh, Humble Yourself t-shirts. You can either get him to sign the t-shirt or you can have him sign something else. For Lorenzo Carter, you can bring the outside item in and uh, have him uh, sign that at really no additional charge, just your ticket into the building while time allows. Uh, that, I believe, is going on from 6 to 7, uh, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, but while time allows, you can get that uh, signed by Lorenzo Carter. So that's going to be a, a really cool thing. Robbie Rangie says, today's my 40th birthday. Uh, I think I need tickets to the Dog Nation appreciation for my birthday present. Robbie, I think that's a great idea. Maybe one of your family members will step up and take care of them. I'd love to see you. Um, and if you do come, let me know so I can uh, come and thank you and tell you happy birthday in person a week from now. Uh, and I hope that's a, a great uh, birthday for you. Gary and Christian Golisano says, uh, uh, I get wanting to get rid of the uh, cupcakes for Georgia. Um, this is on Facebook, by the way. But honestly, for some Georgia fans, it's the only game they can afford to go to. So what do you sacrifice a better game or some fans not getting to go to a game? I think it's a fair question, Gary. You know, it's one of the concerns that I've had. I, I totally respect the uh, football department here, the athletic association and their opportunity to, you know, generate as much revenue as they can for the uh, football program. The one point I've brought up as, as Gary and Christian kind of reflect this on Facebook is what do you do for the fans that are not going to give at that highest level, or maybe can't afford to go travel to the Notre Dame game, can't afford to travel to the Rose bowl, or either just don't want to make that financial choice. What opportunity exists for them? As, as Gary and Christian point out, right now, the one thing about Austin P and the one thing about Middle Tennessee State and UMass, those are the kinds of games that, that some fans get to go to who otherwise wouldn't get to go to any games. I think that's a really fair point. And I, I don't, unfortunately, probably have a great answer to this question because one of the things that you notice about college football is that it's different professional sports. Professional sports just have more opportunities to take care of budget-minded fans you know if you like major league baseball the home slate is 100 or 162 games the, the the total schedule 162 games you play 81 games at home at one point in time i live here in atlanta the atlanta braves had one dollar tickets they had a uh, an entire sort of collection of one dollar tickets that were available every single day they were only available on the day of the game but but they were available every single day and for a long time, they had a lot of general admission $5 tickets. I'm not really quite sure what the cheapest ticket to the new Brave Stadium is. I'm assuming it's more expensive than the ones that I just mentioned. But, you know, baseball historically has been able to sort of take care of budget-conscious fans because they play 81 home games. The NBA can even, from time to time, do the same thing. They play uh, 41 home games. Uh, even at one point, the uh, you know, uh, once again, I live in Atlanta. I know the Falcons had, you know, like the, the $10 um tickets for the upper level seats for a uh, while this has been years ago but they were able to do that they play you know they play eight regular season home games they got the two preseason games that's 10 total games they just have a little bit more inventory that they can they, they can sort of price to sell a little bit more college teams you know like georgia only have the six or seven home games you know that inventory is just it's at more of a premium because there's just less of it and i i'm concerned about that gary i and christian i am I, I'm, I'm concerned about that there's no fan day anymore. There's no autograph day anymore the way there used to be. For the people who liked the old speaking tour, you know, some coaches still do that where they go and, and they uh, you know, talk to fans. You know, the average fan can't even get that from Kirby Smart anymore. And I get why the, the demand completely outpaces the supply. I totally understand that. But what do you do for uh, budget-conscious fans? I think that's the kind of question that hopefully someone at Georgia is still trying to answer. Peter Jeffrey Wilson says those $1 tickets were days of the bad Braves, kind of like now. Actually, they were also at the $1 tickets back when they were still kind of good. Good to see Chad Cahill back in the comment section. I haven't seen him, seen him in a while. Aaron Stevens also points out that the spring game is free. That's for anybody who wants to go. And 
I think for a lot of us, you know, some of y'all are in the same sort of station of life that I am. I have uh, a young son. He's six. I have a young daughter. In a couple months, she'll be three. And let me tell you something. Uh, taking my daughter to a Georgia game, um, I, I just as sooner get a PhD in physics as try to, uh, you know, navigate a full uh, Georgia game with my uh, then two, soon to be three year old daughter. That's just a lot of work. My son now is uh, he's a little bit more into football. You know, it's a little bit easier to keep him entertained. He's kind of into the day a lot more, so it's a little easier to take him than it used to be. But the uh, the very young kids, it's hard to do. But G-Day, you kind of can take them because you don't have to stay for the whole game. You can kind of keep them occupied. Um, you probably saw my kids this past G-Day run up and down the aisle. I mean, there, there was some of that going on. So that is a good point I think that Aaron brought up there is that, is that G-Day is still one of those options for the sort of budget-minded fan because you can get into the building for free. It's a great chance to see Georgia up close and personal. I think that actually G-Day's become a pretty good show uh, for the most part. I think Georgia does a pretty good job of, of kind of, you know, presenting that as almost like a real game day type uh, atmosphere. The weather's been great the uh, last few years. That's a pretty good job. Philip Jordan Wells says uh, uh, CBS is the Charles Baxter Squirrel Show highlight of the day. Yeah, some of y'all are not going to let me live the Charles Baxter thing down. And like I said, if you want to know more about uh, what happened with the Charles Baxter, you can ask Jeff Sintel about that. By the way, shout out to one of my producers, Michael, who was uh, good enough to notice once again we had a, a missing man formation here. Uh, Eddie was a little slow getting on the uh, set here today, but we were able to get him taken care of. Michael helped us out on that. Austin Kilby about coaches of the Dog Nation event. I, I imagine the coaches will be pretty busy that evening, but uh, we'll certainly show some appreciation to... Uh, the uh, players that are there. And by the way, if you're just joining us, how about Lorenzo Carter added to the lineup? That's, I think that's great. I think that's great. Lloyd Dixon that says, has a rivals given Eddie a ranking yet? Yeah. I wonder uh, rivals 24 seven. Can we give Eddie here a uh, four or five star ranking? Can we take care of him on that? William Moore said basketball team looked sharp last night, win it for Yante and uh, 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 t -t today. That'd be, that'd be a good thing to see. A good thing to see. Willie Gray asked a good question. I honestly, I honestly don't know the answer to this. Why don't teams scrimmage against other teams for spring games? I think that's a good question. Uh, um, what I'm assuming the answer is, you know, I don't think coaches for the most part like spring games. I don't think. I think if you gave them their choice, they'd rather have just another controlled scrimmage away from fans, away from media, you know, to do more evaluation. They like scrimmaging more so than they like spring game. I think the spring game becomes a more of a public relations deal that becomes a have to for them more than a want to. And I, I don't think they like the idea of risking any kind of injury for a spring game. The same thing for an exhibition. Let's say Georgia brought in Savannah State and, and uh, scrimmage against Savannah State. Um, does the chance of injury going up if you're playing against someone other than your own team? That may be the only guess I would have on that, but I mean, yeah, listen, you know, G Day is one of those things that when you first get there, the first thing you see is, boy, this is great. It's good to see some football, even if it's not totally real football. And then after a while, it's sort of like artificial sweetener. You know, the first time you taste something that's been artificially sweetened, you're like, eh, it's pretty good. But then, like, third or fourth sip or that third or fourth bite, you're like, oh, this is not the real thing. And to me, spring football is kind of the same thing. Of those first few bites are like, whoa, this is, this is exactly what I love. This is college football. And then it's like, eh. Not, not necessarily. It's a, it's a facsimile, but not necessarily the uh, same thing. Well, um, you know, that may be one of the things that the reason why that is is sort of prevent the, uh, the injury stuff. Jarvis Hanna says, any update on D'Angelo Gibbs? We actually started the show today by talking about D'Angelo Gibbs. Uh, appears in a uh, UGA video. It's from the Boys and Girls Club, and the video is Listen, I, I mean, I hate to admit this, but the video was totally meant to, you know, sort of, you know, show off Georgia doing some great things in the community and sort of football obsessed people like me sort of turn this into a Zapruder film of, ooh, I see Nate Trez Patrick. I see D'Angelo Gibbs. Maybe that means they're about to start playing again. You know, people like me sort of <laughs> take the original intent of the video and totally move it in a, a different direction. But that's the update that I can provide you on uh, Gibbs is that, uh, is that he's back hanging around with the football team again, wearing that Georgia G. and. Uh, that's about as good a sign as you're going to get. Shannon Baker says injuries would be too much of a risk um, when it comes to playing someone else during the spring. I'm sure the coaches feel that way. I mean, I will admit that um, that I'd be entertained by it, and you know, I would always sort of um, uh, you know lean in the direction of being entertained by something. But um, but I certainly do believe that that the injury stuff would go up, and I don't believe coaches want any part of that. 
Austin Kilby says, how about, a, how about that uh, picture with Butch uh, Jones in it? Yeah, we're going to do that on SEC Country Live this afternoon. Y'all don't care about this. This is you know behind-the-scenes stuff. We actually had – where we do our show from in Atlanta, there was like a big water main break yesterday, so our building was essentially empty. We have a whole bunch of folks that help us out with our shows. For the most part, everybody was kind of dispersed in different directions because of – I'm not even really sure what all went on, but like the water main broke and there was no water anywhere. And so we didn't have everybody helping us out. So there's a process for taking these pictures that you see on the internet and sort of, you know, like getting them ready to show on the screen for the show. So we weren't able to show the Butch Jones, Alabama picture yesterday, but I was as entertained by it as everybody else was. And I'm looking forward to talking about that more. It is funny seeing him in Alabama. Sure. And what's great here is my buddy, Mike Johnson, who y'all know that I love, uh, even though I, for the most part, am not giving Mike grief about Butch Jones because I think adding him as an analyst is probably not not a dumb thing for Alabama to be doing. Um, watching Mike cringe, seeing Butch Jones wearing that script Alabama A that they stole from the Atlanta Braves, that is so much fun for me. I I, I cannot get enough of that. It, it, it's really great. Anthony Lee says Georgia's got a lot to promote going into the season, milking prior success for all it's worth. Yeah, I mean, I think I think Georgia's got a lot to sell this season. There's no doubt about that. Miriam Martin Corbin says, why would Alabama take the albatross that is Butch Jones? I think because ultimately his influence on the team is not going to be very high, but his, you know, this is one of those things like, you can sort of stick him in the corner with some busy work. Hey, watch this film. Tell me if you see anything. Hey, you know, tabulate these tendencies. Tell me if you notice anything. Hey, you coached against this team. Anything pop up in your preparation? You know, even if Butch Jones is not that smart, he still, you know, spent a lot of time around the SEC. He may tell you one thing for one game that gives you a little bit of an edge. And for Saban, that may be enough. Justin Sisk says, I'm a dog fan for over 30 years. Been to four games and no G-Days. That artificial sweetener will taste just as good as the real thing. I guess some people just get spoiled with sugar. Well, I hope I'm not. I hope I'm not spoiled because, listen, I'm, I'm appreciative of every uh, snap of Georgia football I get to see. But it sounds like you may be coming to G-Day this year, Justin. I hope you really enjoy it. J.D. Hall says, do you think Georgia is going to dial up some package with Justin Fields this season, even if he doesn't win the job? Yeah, J.D., if I had to guess, that would be my guess, is that Fields is going to be on the field somehow. Now, I still think this is Jake Fromm's job. I think that Jake Fromm is the quarterback, but that doesn't mean that there's room for somebody else to play some, and I think that Fields is too good not to play at all. Let me go to YouTube. YouTube folks are going to strangle me because I, I talk them up, and then I spend the whole time on Facebook, which I obviously love our Facebook audience, but let me say a little to the, these YouTube friends for a second. Uh, sorry, y'all. Um, Hard Times 57 says, going back to the idea of budget-minded fans. Right now, TV is all that there is for people who can't afford the prices of tickets. But I can see the day coming where, it'll, where it will be, uh, you know, pay to see any game. Yeah, I wonder about that. You know, what, what does the future of the TV model, you know, look like? Obviously, the way it is now, the only thing that you can easily sell advertising for on TV are these games. And so, um, you know, TV networks want to charge a lot of money to advertisers for the commercial products during the games but in order to do that you got to keep creating the content you got to promise you know you know pretty high ratings here and so at a certain point in time is that mo model where and i don't not 90 percent y'all don't care about this but that model where the tv network says hey we'll bring in the advertisers we'll bring in the um you know the content and we'll sort of let them meet here in the middle is there a point in time when that sort of breaks down and the uh and, and the sec itself starts trying to distribute its own games I think there's a chance that's a very different world if that ever happens. Ron Thomas also on YouTube says, I feel if you're going to have steep ticket prices, then you try to provide a game worth watching. I mean, listen, Ron, it's that kind of thing that I'm hearing over and over again. Georgia fans are asking these kinds of questions. Am I getting enough for what I'm paying for tickets? And I don't, listen, I don't fault Georgia at all, and I don't, I don't mean to offend those of you who, who, who may feel differently. I don't fault Georgia at all for raising the price of the tickets. I don't think that Georgia has an obligation to sort of artificially inhibit the economy around its uh, football program. I, you know, if Georgia can sell the tickets for more, I, I think that they have the opportunity to do that. I, I wouldn't dispute them th that opportunity. But apart from what they have a right to do or what they have an opportunity to do, 
there's this right and opportunity on the part of fans who say, hey, you know, maybe just blind loyalty where we pay for whatever Georgia gives us or whatever any sporting entity gives us without asking some tough questions. Maybe those days are gone. You know, people are kind of investigating here of, you know, buying season tickets requires me to also buy tickets to games that I can get for five dollars. And that's one of the real secrets here. You know, for those of you that don't go to a lot of games, you know, <laughs> hopefully you're not standing there wondering uh, uh, where the tickets are when the games actually come down. So maybe take my advice, the grain of salt, consult somebody else on this, too. But, you know, historically speaking, games like Austin P and UMass, that if you're patient and if you're, you know, somewhat clever about it you can find your way into the stadium for much less than face value typically and that becomes also an issue for um for uh, georgia fans to think about who do buy the season tickets and obviously the season ticket purchases and the and the donations that are part of that help fund all the great success that georgia's had but the people who buy those tickets do so knowing that some of the tickets they're buying are not worth what they're paying for them they're essentially paying you know what somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 85 dollars for a, a game against austin p that they can only turn around and sell for 10 and the same thing for UMass, and probably the same thing for Middle Tennessee State. That uh, a lot of times, the moment you take it's um, the moment you take possession of the ticket, what you ha- actually are handed over is worth less than you paid for it. I mean, the moment the uh, transaction occurs, and so that's a tough thing for some Georgia fans to deal with. Some guys and gals like the idea of every week buying tickets from a different source and different prices for every one of those tickets because on the average you end up getting uh, you know you know cheaper tickets it's all to be thought about all a lot to think about back on uh, facebook here for a moment eric moody says to be honest sanford stadium needs to upgrade the fan experience it's not worth the five-hour drive for me to sit on uh, aluminum bleachers that, that's also interesting you know obviously a lot of those chair back deals are or the you know the seat cushions are a lot more readily available now um so you know, that option is out there. A lot of the corridors at Sanford Stadium are somewhat small. Getting to some concession stands is still a very difficult thing to do. I think, I think they're trying to do what they can do to, uh, you know, to make it bigger and better. One of the things I think that might be interesting for them to think about at a certain point in time is I've been to Fenway Park before, the uh, Red Sox baseball stadium. It's obviously a very old stadium. And one of the things that they've done is, is they've actually made some of the area around the stadium a ticketed area. And, you know, so you're actually in the stadium before you get in the stadium and that just makes it a little bit freer a little bit easier to walk around i wonder if more of the area around uh sanford stadium now the um the student side of the field they have kind of backed that area up a little bit more and it's kind of like that sort of increase the uh, space that's sort of considered a ticketed area maybe the fan experience is improved by just making the ticketed area larger so that there's a lot more room to move around and maybe some room for some more creative concessions Wayne Fullen says, ooh, Boston, go Yankees. So uh, Wayne's a Yankee fan. Come to find out, Wayne, of course, lives in Pennsylvania. I always appreciate him joining the show. All right, we are late. We've got to get ready to go. Uh, thanks for uh, – I, I like these conversations. You know, um, I'm, I'm always curious what you all think about some of this kind of stuff because, as we said, these are fan issues. You know, how much do you pay for tickets? What's out there for me to enjoy Georgia fandom? It's one of the reasons why we're doing Dog Nation Appreciation because these kind of events don't exist a whole lot more in uh in other realms and so i'm always curious about kind of where you want to see you know the notion of georgia fandom move towards and so i I appreciate these comment sections which give us a chance to do that we'll have the dog nation daily double up in a couple of minutes it'll be at the forum at forum.dognation.com and in a link to our podcast we posted at dognation.com you can uh, check out some bonus content as we look ahead to the sec tournament for georgia against missouri today of course many of you will uh, probably um, hear that after the game is played, but nonetheless, that's what we'll do. 3 p.m. Eastern time for uh, SEC Country Live uh, this afternoon on both the SEC Country and YouTube uh, pages. Uh, I should say both the Facebook and YouTube pages for SEC Country. Uh, and then I'm back again tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. for another episode of Dog Nation Daily Live. Y'all have a great day. I look forward to seeing it. Dog Nation Appreciation.